Scott's got questions. I can think of a wonderful example of leadership involving your father that uh, Mark Murray related to me. Maybe you, you remembered it, but you might want to share it. Was at one of your meetings, things went going real well, and there was a lot of finger pointing going on, and like people blaming other people. And your dad got up and told the story about the milk cart. Remember that? Help me just a little. The milk cart story? When, when your grandfather had decided, well, they'd buy a little milk cart, hitch it up to a horse, and deliver milk around. And on the first trip out, he gave that job to your dad, who was maybe 10 or 12 at the time. He sent him out with that. You remember that? Your dad told that story. Is this the one where the, where the, where the horse ran away with him? The horse ran away with him, <laughs> busted up the milk cart. Yep. You know, this, this meeting was going on where everybody was pointing fingers at everybody. So your dad got up. And he told this story about how this horse ran away and, and just the cart got all busted up and you know your dad was chasing it, trying to catch him, <laughs> ended up in, in your grandpa's front yard with a busted up milk cart, and your dad was just afraid that you know your grandpa was gonna be really mad at him. And your grandfather came running out of the house when he saw this and he said, Fred, are you all right? Yeah. Well, that was and, the end of the finger pointing. Well, and is that does that give you the security to take a risk and make a mistake? Um, Fabulous leadership. We, well, thank you. Yeah, we we opened. I mean, and, and in my organization, we have made, of course, so many mistakes, and we continue to make them every day. But one that some of you may remember, we thought as Costco and Sam's Club were expanding, that wholesale warehouse clubs were the future of discount retailing and we opened a group of stores called Source Club, the Home Depot, for those of you who know that out at uh, 28th Street in Patterson on the way to the airport was once, it was opened, built and opened as a Source Club. Um, and we were too little too late. Uh, Walmart and Sam's, again, they they could crush us. This is the company, this was a business where you're selling commodities to small businesses to a large extent and if they could drop the price on a case of Coke or whatever it might be, and, and, and you're a small business or an organization buying that product. We couldn't differentiate. We couldn't. We didn't have enough to, to offset that. And so, just a few months after we opened the first one, we closed them. And I say we. I was. I was a part of the decision, but I really have to say I, I was. I might have. I might have tried to hang in there longer and been tenacious to no good effect. Um, that can happen too, of course. Um, the, instead, we decided to get out of it. But I think it came from that willingness to fail, that willingness to make mistakes. And that's like each of these little words we throw out, like risk taking, you can, you can it, it's infinitely, yeah, you, it, to be drawn out in, in all sorts of wonderful directions. But that willingness to fail is critical. And, and so, that willingness to fail comes from risk taking. It comes from trust, trusting that you won't lose your job or lose face or be humiliated if you if you did your best and you made a mistake. It comes from optimism, knowing that hey, it's worth trying again just because we got burned last time. In fact, um, as as our as our company has evolved, the you know, our senior leadership group. I go from being the youngest to the oldest in that group, and that's a different dynamic. And I have to bite my tongue sometimes and not say when somebody comes up with a new idea, oh, we tried that 20 years ago. <laughs> so what a, and think about that, what a, what a bad thing that is for a leader to say. How crushing it would be for any of you who come to the person you're working with, with what you think is a great idea, and you say, oh, you know, we tried that 20 years ago. You feel stifled. Probably why a lot of wonderful innovations happen because somebody says, well, I think it is good. You know, we go try it and prove you're wrong. But you feel stifled. <laughs> but also, what happened 20 years ago, the circumstances may have changed entirely. So it's so that, that older generation may have tried it, they shouldn't keep you from trying it, and it may not have worked then and it might work now. So uh, that too is, is a critical component. Yes. I'm more familiar with your family's leadership in the community here in the last week. One of the 
I'm wondering is what you do inside of your organization as a corporation to encourage leadership and grow leaders? Um, the, you always feel like you can do more, of course, but one of the things you do is give people opportunities in areas other than what they trained for or grew up in. Our senior vice president of, what's his title, senior vice president of distribution and logistics and manufacturing, person in charge of all of the warehousing and trucking, and we have a central kitchen in northern Indiana where we're going to begin breaking breads and things like that. He was a pharmacist by trade and worked in store operations for many years. And, but a very bright, gifted leader said, why don't you try this? So I think that sort of cross-pollination, which you hope as an institution you've got the flexibility, and as, a, as an individual, as a, as a potential leader, you've got the flexibility, says, well, you know, gosh, I went to pharmacy school, but I've got gifts and opportunities that may take me in other directions. Don't pigeonhole me as a pharmacist. So I guess that would be um, something that comes very quickly to mind. We're just, the, the retail business, in fact, it's an interesting uh, subject that you raised that has never been historically terribly glamorous. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that hotshot young MBAs come out of school and say, I want to go into retail. You know, it's finance, it used to be manufacturing, it's other things rather than retailing. And what, and, and more people have grown up in, in retailing typically because it didn't have a large technological dimension or, or, or um, other things that required an advanced education, it tended to be things that, uh, tended to be a place where people could find opportunities without any specific training. And so, um, for many years, the president of our company, Earl Holden, um, graduated from high school but didn't go to college. My dad didn't go to college. Um, but people could learn by doing. And that's a wonderful sort of democratic thing. We didn't say, well, you've got to have a degree in this field or a degree at this level in order to aspire to leadership in the company. But at the same time, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make the business necessarily as enticing as it ought to be because from someone on the inside, it is constantly changing. I mean, it's, and, and I guess you could say that about any endeavor, but it really is kind of the daily pulse of the community in many ways. As people shop with you and interact, you interact with your customers, um, it's not a manufacturer who may have a handful of very large customers. It's, it's everything touches you and you touch everything in some ways. And, how do we begin to convey that excitement as an industry? And in fact, the, the Food Marketing Institute, which is the trade group for, for supermarkets in the country, is revamping their whole way of doing business and trying to develop a leadership program to, to help encourage people to think as leaders within an industry that hasn't really done very, a very good job at that. So, and our company is like that too. Just in the last year or two, we've had, we've, we've been, here I'm, I'm talking to Hauenstein fellows who are in some of the same boat, but we've tried to identify younger leaders and potential leaders in our company and have them work with mentors who are more senior executives in the organization. And so that's, that's something that's very important to us. But I would, I would say that the more open the organization is where you can have people working in cross-functional teams and that kind of stuff. If you're going to allow people's leadership to become apparent once once they get out of the, the particular silo they're in. Yes? Thanks for your talk, I, I appreciate it. And I think that something that's come up um, kind of here month by month, and maybe it's kind of cliche, is that in order to be a great leader, you need to be a great follower. Which I think is true, but we really don't read or hear much about that. Uh, we all, we're sitting here, we want to be aspiring leaders, but what can you tell us about being a um, loyal or um, competent followers.